Hello friends, Steve Stockton here with you. Welcome to our latest episode. In this video, we bring you creepy stories and legends from the Appalachian Trail and surrounding areas. Now, the Appalachian Trail, or the AT, while not the longest trail, is considered the longest hiking footpath globally, spanning 2,200 miles. It attracts an estimated 2 to 3 million hikers annually. The trail passes through 14 states from Georgia to Maine, providing a range of unique landscapes, including rugged wilderness and quaint villages with stunning views. Due to this diversity, it is a perfect destination for hikers of all levels. Despite its enchanting beauty, the trail's more secluded areas have been the site of some disturbing incidents. Unfortunately, there have been violent assaults and around a dozen reported murders since the first one recorded in 1974. The trail passes through desolate mountains and thick forests, leading to chilling experiences for hikers and giving rise to scary stories and urban legends. In this video, we'll explore some of the legends and paranormal encounters associated with the Appalachian Trail. Join me. Let's walk and see. Now, there have been reports from hikers who have walked long distances on the Appalachian Trail without encountering anyone else, which can lead to feelings of isolation and unsettling thoughts. In a few cases, investigations have suggested that there may be unusual things to discover while on the trail. First up, Dudley Town, the Cursed Village. The quiet town of Cornwall was settled in the mid-18th century, much like many other areas of Connecticut. The first Dudleys from England, via Guilford, arrived in the Litchfield Hills in 1747. They played a pivotal role in forming a prosperous community, then known as Owlsbury, primarily driven by the burgeoning iron industry in the region. The settlers constructed homes, farmed the land, and forged iron, leading to the town's growth and prosperity. The town's eventual demise can be attributed to various factors, such as the depletion of farmland, the decline of the iron industry in the area, and the natural progression of younger Americans moving westward to settle new lands. However, some people believe that the Dudley clan was cursed, as many Dudleys met an untimely demise and this curse extended to the village they founded. For reasons unknown, the population of Dudleys decreased over time and eventually dwindled to a point where the last resident abandoned the remaining town at the start of the 20th century. The surrounding forest gradually consumed the homes and buildings, leaving only a few decaying foundations and empty cellars as remnants of what once was. There is a widespread belief that those who have attempted to reside in Dudley Town have experienced terrible misfortune. Supposedly, there have been numerous incidents ranging from self-harm to demonic possessions causing a great deal of hysteria. Paranormal investigators Ed and Lorraine Warren even filmed a Halloween special in Dudley Town during the 1970s, official declaring it demonically possessed. This declaration essentially paved the way for supernatural occurrences. The location has been a site for numerous reports of paranormal activities, including sightings of apparitions and ghostly figures that elicit feelings of fear and unease among visitors. Unfortunately, the area has also caught the interest of individuals obsessed with dark powers and satanic practices, along with many inexperienced ghost hunters and mischievous adolescents. Consequently, it has turned into a place associated with evil and doom. It's important to note that the supposed curse of Dudley Town has primarily been proven false, with even a descendant of the Dudley family, Reverend Gary P. Dudley, debunking the myth. However, despite the lack of actual curses, supernatural occurrences or dark tragedies in the town's history, people still enjoy sharing spooky stories about it. The ruins of Dudley Town are located on private property owned by the Dark Entry Forest Association. They strictly prohibit all visitors, local and state police, will arrest and prosecute any trespassers. Next, we have the Moon-Eyed People. Both Appalachian folk tales and Cherokee legends suggest that there could be a group of pale-skinned humanoids known as the Moon-Eyed People hiding in the Appalachian Range. The Moon-Eyed People are commonly linked to the small town of Murphy, North Carolina. They are alleged to have a short, stout build and white skin, bearded faces, and large blue eyes. As per legend, 
Their eyes were susceptible to the sun, making them nocturnal creatures and earning them the moniker Moon Eyed. According to legend, the indigenous Native American tribes would wait for the full moon to drive out the Moon Eyed people from their underground caves. The bright light would weaken them, forcing them to flee to other areas of Appalachia permanently. The Moon Eyed people, unlike other Appalachian monsters, were believed to be a unique and distinct race of people rather than supernatural entities. It's believed that the Moon Eyed people were actually European settlers. However, the legend surrounding them is so startling that it originates from a time well before Christopher Columbus' arrival in America. Presently, exhibits of the Moon Eyed people can be found at the Cherokee County Historical Museum in Murphy, North Carolina. There's a three foot tall sculpture of two co joined figures thought to represent Moon Eyed people from the early 1840s. Port Mountain, a Georgia State Park near Ellijay, Georgia, contains the ruins of an 850 foot long stone wall that is said to have been constructed by this mysterious tribe of people. And now, apparitions of Civil War soldiers. Throughout history, numerous wars have been waged on multiple fronts. In 1862, three significant battles of the Civil War took place across various areas of what is currently referred to as the Maryland section, situated along the Appalachian Trail. Many lives, particularly those of soldiers, were lost in the violent and ongoing conflict. The number of soldier casualties was so great that some believe their spirits linger on. Hikers on the Appalachian Trail who pass through these areas have shared eerie stories. There have been reports of ghost soldiers, strange campfires, and the distant sounds of cannons by some people. Close to the pass where the fighting was intense is the farm of a man named Daniel Wise. It is believed that the remains of 58 soldiers were thrown into an old well on his property, which has led to sightings of ghostly figures wandering around Wise land. Next, we have the Pierce Pond Ghost. Some individuals enjoy hiking the Appalachian Trail solo, but this has led to negative experiences for some, according to stories. One man, for example, was trekking along Pierce Pond in Maine when he encountered two shocking incidents that have stayed with him forever. After hiking several miles and camping at different locations, he settled at the Pierce Pond camp area for the night. While enjoying his campfire, he noticed a figure walking nearby. Upon closer inspection, the figure appeared ghostly and resembled a rugged outdoorsman carrying what appeared to be fishing equipment. During that first night, the spectral figure gradually faded into the darkness. The man resumed his hike the next day, only to come face to face with a ghostly figure once more. This encounter was more frightening than the previous, as the figure halted and gave him an unsettling stare that sent shivers down his spine. Without hesitation, the hiker left his campsite, dashed into the forest, took cover behind a tree, and waited until morning. Once daylight broke, he quickly returned to his camp gathered his belongings, and left the area before nightfall caught up with him again. And there's the story of the Flatwoods Monster. In the summer of 1952, Edward and Fred May, two brothers from Flatwoods, West Virginia, rushed home to tell their mother, Kathleen May, about a strange event they had just witnessed. While playing football at Flatwoods School Playground, they saw a bright object swiftly fly across the sky and land on a nearby farmer's property. Ms. May and her sons, along with some other boys from the area, were curious about what had occurred on the neighbor's land and went looking for answers. As the sun set, they noticed an unusual object in the woods. According to Andrew Smith, the executive director of the Braxton County CVB and curator of the Flatwood Monster Museum, the thing had an odd shape. It was emitting a red glow accompanied by smoke or steam. During this adventure, 17-year-old National Guardsman Eugene Lemon witnessed a pulsating light and directed his flashlight toward it. He spotted a, quote, 10-foot monster with bright eyes, a blood-red face, and green glowing body perched in a tree, end quote. The monster then hissed and floated toward the group, causing Lemon to scream and drop his flashlight. According to newspaper reports, Several of the party fainted and vomited for several hours after returning to town. Later, Ms. May was quoted as saying that the monster looked worse than Frankenstein. The group turned and ran down the hill, immediately reporting what they saw to the local sheriff. 
Several men armed with shotguns returned to the scene with Lemon an hour later. According to local reports, they were met with a horrible smell and saw what they described as slight heat waves in the air. Authorities didn't find much, says Smith. What was found was gathered and sent to Washington, D.C. and never seen again. Smith says one of the reasons the Flatwoods monster encounter is so intriguing is that it was only the second or third of its kind and likely one of the first with so many witnesses. It made national headlines, says Smith. Today, on the main road into town, a sign reads, Welcome to Flatwoods, home of the green monster. The UFO sighting, or whatever it was, is in the past but not forgotten. There's not a consensus on what happened in Flatwoods that evening, says Smith. You have your UFO true believers and skeptics who think it was a misidentified barn owl, Smith explains. If I had to pick one, he says, I'd say the most commonly held thought is that the monster is a fun and interesting bit of folklore. Having to decide whether it's real or fake takes all the fun out of it. Next up, the giggling children. There's a spooky tale about some children who appeared unnatural and unsettling to a group of hikers on the AT. The hikers had hiked for miles and set up camp in a particular spot. They were met with an unusual and eerie sight when they woke up the morning after a peaceful sleep. They discovered that their campsite was enveloped by dense mist that failed to dissipate despite the sun shining. As they gathered their belongings, they heard children's laughter emanating from their surroundings. The group was almost done packing up when a group of children, led by one parent, walked out of the mist and passed them. These creepy children asked the hikers where they were going, and someone responded they were hiking along the Appalachian Trail. The kids started laughing, and one replied, this isn't the Appalachian Trail, as they kept walking off. The hikers spent the whole day hearing the children giggling around them from the woods. Next, the Bell Witch Haunting. Not too far west of the Great Smoky Mountains National Park is the town of Adams, Tennessee. John and Lucy Bell were farmers who settled in Adams around 1803. They lived peacefully on their land until 1817 when the family began experiencing odd and unexplainable occurrences in their home. They began hearing noises such as scratching, knocks on the walls, and change being dragged across the floor, says Pat Fitzhugh, a friend of mine who's an author and historian who's written two books about the events on the Bell Farm. Over time, the noises became more intense and more frequent. Then, the Bell's two daughters began complaining of something trying to pull at their covers and pinch them while they slept. The Bells chose to keep quiet about the unusual occurrences in their home for more than a year because they were concerned about the opinion of their church community. However, the harassment persisted and eventually, John Bell confided in one of his neighbors about the strange incidents. This neighbor visited their home and experienced similar disturbances. As word spread, the news of the events became known throughout the eastern and southeastern regions, according to Fitzhugh. Visitors started flocking to the Bell Farm to witness the eerie occurrence. Some were inquisitive, while others aimed to disprove the Bell's claims. Fitzhugh says, over time, it seems this thing, whatever it was, fed off attention and people's fears. It eventually developed a whispering voice, and within a year, it could speak audibly. People have written down and passed through generations accounts of what this thing allegedly said, says Fitzhugh. It liked to argue religion and make fun of people, except for Mrs. Bell. It stated its purpose was to kill John Bell. The poltergeist was named Kate after it declared itself to be the witch of a woman named Kate Batts from the area. Following John Bell's death in December of 1820, Kate claimed responsibility for his demise, citing his evil nature as the reason for her actions. The Bell farm gradually returned to its usual routine until Betsy Bell, the family's youngest daughter, announced her engagement to a nearby resident named Joshua Gardner. Kate revowed her scorn and disapproval about Betsy Bell's upcoming marriage, says Fitzhugh. She talked Betsy into breaking off the engagement with Joshua. A short time later, the poltergeist said she would leave but promised to return in seven years. Seven years later, Kate did return, visiting John Bell Jr., who was not living at the Bell Farm then. They allegedly talked for three nights about the past, present, and future, explains Fitzhugh. After that, the Bell Witch bid farewell and promised to return in 107 years. That would have been 1935. Some said she returned and some said she didn't, says Fitzhugh. 
Now, the real story behind the tale of the Bell Witch has never been uncovered. Some thought it was an act of the supernatural, says Fitzhugh. Skeptics accused the Bell family of doing it by knowing how to act and using ventriloquism. Some thought they did it for money, but the Bell family never charged a cent to anyone staying over in their home. Though Fitzhugh has considered many theories, he says he doesn't know what the Bell Witch was. When you look at how long the story has endured and how many people have put forth theories, doctors, lawyers, and preachers back in the day signed eyewitness manuscripts saying they witnessed these things, says Fitzhugh, it makes it more than just your standard folk tale. And now, the Brown Mountain Lights. The Brown Mountain Lights in the Blue Ridge Mountains of North Carolina have long been a fascinating Appalachian mountain enigma. Visitors and locals alike have witnessed unusual glowing orbs in shades of blue, white, orange, and red hovering about 15 feet above the ground in Brown Mountain near Morganton, North Carolina. According to legend, a fierce fight between Cherokee and Catawba Braves on Brown Mountain resulted in numerous casualties. After the battle, Catawba women would search for their lost family members at night using torches to light their way. Some people believe that the lights observed today are the spirits of these Catawba women who are still looking for their lost loved ones. In 1771, German engineer John William Gerhard de Brom saw and recorded the Brown Mountain Lights in his journal. However, some doubt was cast on de Brom's account as he claimed to have seen the lights every night, which some speculated could have been distant train lights. There have been many documented sightings of the Brown Mountain Lights throughout the 20th century, particularly after the Linville area gained access to electricity. Although these sightings are often unpredictable, the lights are commonly observed at night, particularly following periods of rainfall. The Brown Mountain Overlook, Wiseman's View Overlook, and Lost Cove Cliffs Overlook are highly sought after locations to catch a glimpse of these lights. I've seen them myself and it is definitely worth the trip. These spots can be accessed via North Carolina 105 South or North Carolina 181 near Asheville and Boone. Regardless of the time of day, these overlooks provide breathtaking scenic views, if nothing else. And now we have the story of the Mothman. In 1966, Point Pleasant was a small town with just a few thousand residents located at the junction of the Ohio and Kanawha Rivers. In November of that year, the town experienced a disturbance caused by an unidentified being. Grave diggers at a cemetery in Clendenin, West Virginia, about 80 miles from Point Pleasant, claimed to have seen a man with wings flying over their heads and taking off from a nearby tree. Three days later, two young couples who drove near an abandoned World War II TNT plant, approximately five miles north of Point Pleasant, claimed they saw a large flying man with 10-foot wings and red glowing eyes. The individuals tried to flee from the unidentified creature, driving almost 100 miles per hour. However, the beast chased them and pursued them until they reached the city limits of Point Pleasant. Fearing for their safety, they promptly reported the incident to the local authorities. The media dubbed the creature Mothman, and the story gained national attention, making Mothman a sensation. During the following week, there were at least eight additional reported sightings of a bird-like creature with massive wings in and around Point Pleasant. Captain Paul Yoder and Benjamin Enochs, who were volunteer firefighters, provided one of these accounts. As per the Gettysburg Times, Yoder and Enix reported seeing a bird of considerable size with red eyes that were equally large. Some individuals dispute the reported sightings, suggesting that the people of Point Pleasant may have observed a sandhill crane that had deviated from its usual migration path. There were hundreds of eyewitnesses, says Jeff Wamsley, owner of Point Pleasant's Mothman Museum. Born and raised in the town, Wamsley was only five years old when the Mothman appeared and began terrorizing his neighbors. Throughout the following year, peculiar incidents persisted. Point Pleasant authorities received an influx of reports detailing UFO sightings and encounters with mysterious men in black. Furthermore, the sightings of Mothman persisted. A tragic incident occurred in 1967, just 10 days before Christmas. During rush hour traffic, the Silver Bridge, which connected Point Pleasant to Gallipolis, Ohio, collapsed and caused the death of 46 individuals. According to some reports, there were sightings of the Mothman at or even on the bridge shortly before its collapse, and it was believed that the creature's presence was a sign of the impending disaster. Wamsley says, the fact that the UFO sightings, men in black presence, and the Silver Bridge disaster 
all happened during the Mothman sightings intrigues many people. It's a fascinating turn of events for a small town like Point Pleasant. According to Wamsley, the residents of Point Pleasant had an encounter with something indeed out of the ordinary. I just don't believe that many people could have made up the same story, says Wamsley. But what it was they saw, I don't believe will ever be truly explained or solved. And now, the legend of Spearfinger. Several creepy legends associated with the Appalachian Trail originate from the Cherokee people. One of these legends is about Spearfinger, which has been used to frighten children for generations. Spearfinger is described as a witch-like hag who can disguise herself as a friendly old grandmother or even a family member. Spearfinger lurks around the Smoky Mountains' highest peaks as she focuses on children who have wandered away from their homes and parents. These children are usually afraid, which Spearfinger takes advantage of as she tells them she'll help, but her antic is to sing them to sleep slowly. She then uses her finger, made of obsidian, to gouge out their liver and eat it before them. And now we have a story of a young girl who spotted a ghost while camping on the Appalachian Trail. While hiking with her parents on the Appalachian Trail, a young girl experienced her first encounter with the paranormal. The trio made camp for the night, and as her parents slept, she became frightened by something that kept her from being able to rest. The following day, after the eerie night passed, the girl took a brief walk with her mother before they continued their hike. While walking around and enjoying each other's company, her mother suddenly stopped and stared blankly into the distance. The young girl followed her mother's gaze and saw a hazy apparition against a tree a few yards from where they were standing. The man appeared calm but sad, and then he faded away, leaving the tense mother and child bewildered and fearful. And now, the legend of the Scorched Man. While hiking along the Appalachian Trail, it's not uncommon to experience inner fears and imagine being followed or pursued by unseen humans, animals, or forces. In 2011, a confident man decided to take a week off from work and hike the trail alone. At first, the hiker's journey went well until a terrifying incident occurred that left a lasting impression. On his first day, as he made his way down the trail, night fell, prompting him to set up camp. While alone in the dark, the man heard strange noises approaching his tent. Although slightly alarmed, he wasn't bothered enough to investigate the source of the sounds. The following day, he continued hiking and set up his camp before nightfall. While sitting around his fire later that evening, he was left shocked when he saw a man with badly burned hands, a burned body, and a smoking face standing near his firewood. This experience shocked and left him numb as the burned figure gazed at him before walking away. The terrified man decided to pack up his belongings and leave the area immediately, only to come across a recently burned down house with a sheriff outside. The sheriff told the man that the entire family burned alive in the house four days prior. Was the apparition that the man witnessed among those that had perished in the fire? Next, we have another phantom encounter on the trail. During a hike on the Appalachian Trail in May of 1972, a lone hiker encountered what appeared to be a ghost from another time. While on the hike, the hiker noticed a dense ground fog surrounding him, which startled him. As he looked up, he saw a prominent figure walking towards him, wearing a heavy coat and wide-brimmed hat. The phantom slowly staggered about, its eyes facing the ground as if searching for something it had lost. This figure then started walking towards the frightened hiker, still looking at the ground, which made the hiker move aside to avoid being bumped into. As the phantom crossed his path, he suddenly looked at the hiker with cloudy blue eyes, which seemed to stare directly through him. What surprised the hiker the most was that the man's clothing seemed to come from a different period, and he never responded when he tried to say hello. The hiker continued on and looked back for one last glimpse of the eerie figure, only to discover the man had vanished. And what about the story of mysterious abduction by unknown people? Now, there have been accounts of individuals being abducted while hiking and later found after becoming extremely disoriented. In 1988, a hiker had a terrifying experience that, to him, was even more frightening than encountering an apparition. As the man was hiking along the trail, 
he noticed a bright light emanating from the forest behind him. He was not bothered by anyone, nor did he investigate the source of the light, but he decided to set up camp for the night somewhere nearby. Later, he was awakened by a strange man standing over his hammock. The unfamiliar, lurking man also got startled, fled, and yelled to some other unseen people that the hiker was awake. Being terrified by this incident, the hiker quickly packed up his gear and hurriedly continued his hike to put more distance between himself and the unseen people. He continued hiking non-stop for some time. Nevertheless, while resting in his hammock some nights later, he was cut down, wrapped up, and dragged away to some undisclosed location. Unknown people beat him mercilessly as they shouted to one another while others prepared something. Luckily, the hiker got a chance to cut through his hammock and escape. He reported the incident to the authorities, but the officials never found anyone responsible for attacking him that night. And what about the couple that were watched by unknown forces? A young couple had a frightening experience while hiking on the Appalachian Trail in Virginia's southern region. During the night, while they were sleeping in their tent, they were suddenly awakened by odd noises and rustling sounds coming from outside their campsite. The young man ventured out to investigate and successfully frightened off some mysterious figures lurking about. It seemed the figures had wanted him to pursue them, but he chose not to. The couple then camped the next night with their backs against a cliff, guns at the ready. While the couple slept, the figures returned. Startled awake, the couple fired shots into the woods and the figures quickly retreated. The pair hurriedly left the area, and by midday, they noticed the silhouette of someone standing in the distance watching them. Fortunately, they were able to leave the trail and reach civilization without any harm. And now, the legend of the Wampus Cat. The Wampus Cat, also known as the Cherokee Death Cat, is a large feline resembling a mountain lion or cougar. It is said to have tan yellow fur, six legs, and striking yellow eyes. According to legend, the creature's origin is rooted in a curse placed upon a Cherokee woman who witnessed a sacred pre-hunt ritual. She took refuge beneath the pelt of a large cat and was subsequently transformed into the half-woman, half-beast featured in this popular Appalachian myth. The Wampus Cat is said to roam the mountains alone and often expresses her frustration through angry behavior. She is known for standing on her hind legs and using her supernatural powers to drive her victims insane. Even though the Wampus Cat folktale features the Cherokee people, the name likely comes from the word Catawampus, a mountain folklore that describes a boogeyman or something that had gone badly. In 1964, there were reports of a strange creature wandering around US-70. The newspaper dubbed it the Wampus Cat, and the name ended up sticking. And then there's the legend of Bigfoot. Now, legends of Bigfoot are ancient, and have been passed down through generations. Stories of wild men in the woods are known by different names in different cultures. The Salish Sasquatch call it Sasquatch, while the Algonquin of the North Central region refer to it as the Wittico or Wendigo. Other nations tell tales of a creature similar to a man, but with special powers and characteristics. According to the Ojibwe of the Northern Plains, the beast would appear during times of danger and other cultures believed that it was a warning messenger, encouraging people to alter their behavior. Starting in the late 1800s and continuing into the 1900s, North American settlers reported sightings of a mysterious creature. Huge footprints, sporadic encounters, and grainy photos and videos later only added to the mystery. The cryptid is said to stalk the woods, occasionally frightening campers, loggers, and hikers, with numerous accounts documented in the North Georgia mountains. Witnesses have described the creature as a giant upright ape or even a hairy human standing over eight feet tall and possessing a powerful, robust build. In the Berkshires of western Massachusetts, numerous sightings of Bigfoot have been reported, including along the Appalachian Trail, in Beartown State Forest, and the October Mountain State Forest. Presently, the debate and research continues. Entire organizations exist to study and document Bigfoot and prove its existence, and groups regularly search the Northwest woods looking for that ultimate proof. Today, individuals can commemorate this mythical monster of the Appalachian region by attending the Bigfoot Festival in Marion, North Carolina. 
And to round things out, how about some Appalachian superstitions? Many of these I heard from my grandma, but after speaking with her Tennessee-based family, author Amy Lewis comprised a list of these superstitions. The following are just 10 of her findings. Number one, never close a knife you didn't open or you'll have bad luck for seven years. Number two, keep a penny in your washer. Number three, always go out the same door you came in. Number four, eat black-eyed peas and collard greens with hog jaw on New Year's Day. Number five, don't wash clothes on New Year's Day or you'll wash a family member out. Number six, don't let a pregnant woman see a dead person or the baby will have a birthmark. Number seven, don't let anyone sweep under your feet. Number eight, hang a mirror by the door to protect against evil. Number nine, plant your crops under the full moon. And number 10, open the window when someone dies and cover all the mirrors so their soul can leave. In conclusion, the Appalachian Trail traverses through several remote and barren regions, such as mountains and dense forests, which can lead to eerie experiences for hikers. Superstitions and legends are an integral part of Appalachian culture. These myths and folk tales have been handed down through generations and showcased in hit TV shows like The X-Files and Mountain Monsters. The region's extensive history, which includes the amalgamation of European, African, and Native American cultures, has given rise to numerous urban legends, folk tales, and ghost stories throughout the area. Well, friends, there you have it. What do you think of these creepy stories from the Appalachian Trail and from the Southern Appalachians in general? I look forward to your comments, but please keep it friendly and respectful. Until we meet again, be good to yourselves and each other. Stay safe out there. As for me, I'll see you a little further on down the trail. I'm Steve Stockton, and I'll talk to you next time. And please, tell your animals Steve says hi.